Thank you, Marta. Let's go to this Google Doc now, I guess, right? Yeah, so we have two questions there. But let's go through these two and then people can ask directly. On okay, yeah. To you. Okay, so the first one, why is the 1-year-90 VASP interface not working for the newer version of 1-year-90? Uh, um, actually, um, that has been uh, changed. But um, so the, the code, so the next, the next, uh, we have just today released a, a bug fix for FASP 6.1, but we will be releasing for FASP 6.2 in the fall. And that, uh, that has an interface for the latest version of 1 year 90. So the problem was that uh, the way that, um, so basically, what we uh, supported uh, in one year 90 worked for one year 90 1.2 uh, and most of it worked for one year 92.1 but the way that uh, that um, um, spinors so if you went to non-collinear uh, magnetism or um, spin orbit coupling the way spinors were interpreted by uh, one year 90 uh, changed from version 1 to to uh, version 2 something um, and that would it would have been difficult to um, to basically support both. And now we will support the use of one year ninety three, which is the latest version, and that will be present in FASP six point two. Okay. Thanks. Are there known problems currently with the HSE hybrid functional interfacing with Cori K and L nodes? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe, uh, I, I guess from the question, I think it's a leading question, right? So I, I, I guess the answer is yes, but but I, I don't have experience with it. Maybe Senji, do you know? Is there? Uh, I don't know any um, issues from my end, but I guess we needed to look into. I mean, in what? Yes. So so it, I, I I guess from from the from from the fact that this question is there. I guess that that somebody has a problem. If that is the case, then then I hope that they uh, that they will make the problem known to you, and then we can look at it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But I I would not was not aware of problems. But yeah, me yes. neither. So whoever posted this question, yeah, so provide more information so I can follow up. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There is one more in the. Google. So how does the RPA compare with hybrids for computational time? Well, actually, I think it actually compares quite favorably uh, in terms of computational time, because you don't, don't do uh, you don't do self consistency at the um, RPA level. So you basically work with DFT um, DFT wave functions. And then, of course, the computation of the RPA correlation energy is time consuming. But if you run a, a large a hybrid functional, uh, a large system with a hybrid functional, then the, the actual uh, self consistency cycle tends to take up quite a bit of time. So, where the comparison uh, is unfavorable, I would say, is with respect to memory. So, the, the, this cubic scaling RPA really eats up. Uh, quite a bit of memory. So, um, yeah, you would need uh, either nodes with a lot of memory or a lot of nodes. So, but in a world where computers grow bigger and bigger and bigger, I, I have the feeling that there's useful things uh, to be done uh, with, with this cubic scaling RPA. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Hello, good morning. Hi. Hi. Hi, uh, thank you very much for the nice talk. I actually write the question in the chat. Yeah. My question is, it is possible that bus recognize the magnetic point groups in every functional calculations? No, no. No, that, that, is, that, that is very difficult <laughs> <laughs> to do. I mean, we could... Uh, uh, possibly interface with with another uh, symmetry package but to expand our current symmetry package in that sense is not not planned uh, to 
to be done. So, I mean that those kind of things are are not easy to do. Actually, the symmetry analysis is a constant uh, source of headache. Um, we have now in the newest version uh, of the code we have interfaced with SPG lib, um, so we are now able to check. Uh, so why why is symmetry? Let me let me put it like this: Why is symmetry analysis difficult? Symmetry analysis is difficult not because in essence it's a very difficult uh, thing to do, but because what uh, the input uh, contains often a lot of noise, and you have to write a symmetry code that is robust with respect to this, and that is very different, very difficult. Um, there are, of course, uh, symmetry packages, uh, large ones, uh, very good ones, uh, very advanced ones that uh, can do this for, um, for magnetic point groups as well, but that would be a tremendous work to, uh, to duplicate that work in VASP. Um, what we could uh, envision is at some point to, um, to use other symmetry packages. Um, yeah, that, that is one possibility. Thank you, Professor, for, for the answer. Yeah, it, can, can you maybe tell a bit why, why is this, uh, is this uh, necessary for you? Do you need it so? so? Yeah, yes, it's because in some cases, antiferromagnets need uh, to the correct wave functions with the spiral recoupling, yeah. uh, the correct symmetries to export to Vanier. And mm -hmm. in the in the path, sometimes I lost the the symmetry. Okay. So Marta, we had we have a couple more questions in the Google Doc. Oh, oh okay. I have to switch uh, screen. Uh, are SIC obsolete now? Uh, I I think you mean self interaction corrections. Um, I don't know. I have not heard about them for such a long time. I, I know that uh, that self-interaction corrections, uh, explicit self-interaction uh, corrections, um, I think uh, maybe I've not heard from them for the last 20 years or so. Uh, so it, I would tentatively say, uh, yes, they are obsolete now. Um, but maybe I then insult somebody really badly. I, I don't want to insult somebody's work uh, and it might be very useful to some people, but I've really not heard about, uh, about any um, uh, developments in that, uh, in that direction for a very long time. Yeah, let's go down to next one while the user's still typing. So next one, how does yeah. that? The how does the RPA compute the excited state? Um, so an excited state in that sense, um, so to ex uh, yeah, if you do GW in the, um, in the random phase approximation, you get um, basically you get band structure. You get these quasi particle energies at certain uh, Bloch wave vectors. So the band structure in the sense that you know it. Um, but there's a big difference namely in this uh, GW approximation, and these, band, these quasi particle energies, they have an actual physical meaning. So they are the energy that, it would, uh, that you would gain uh, when, you, uh, uh, when, you, when you add or absorb the energy that, you would, uh, that it would cost to remove a particle out of an orbital uh, or the energy that you would gain to add a particle to a particular quasi particle orbital. So in that sense, uh, this, these quasi-particle energies um, are excitation energies. So you, they are really uh, adsorption and, uh, and emission processes. Um, so that is how you would compute excited states in the, um, uh, in the random phase approximation by means of solving these GW equations. Um, to do a, if you, if you are after an answer whether you can get a total energy out of, uh, out of this ACFTT for an excited state, so do something like a delta SCF calculation, that is not possible. So what we are currently doing, and there's a lot of work that went in and there, and that has been um, published recently by Mersuk Kaltak, 
um, who is working for the VASP company and who has uh, worked on these frequency grids and time grids. Uh, he has um, managed to uh, downsample, uh, so to compress the, the uh, Matsubara frequency grid that you would need for finite temperature calculations and to, uh, to compress that uh, using these minimax uh, techniques. Um, so we, we are going to uh, use uh, grids there uh, that are um, that are formally uh, uh, correct for finite temperature. So that is in some way uh, excited state as well, but not maybe in the way that you mean. Will any future versions of VASP support interactive structure updates? I think that we already do. Um, yes. Might be that that uh, that there is something that has to. I think we already do that. There was I, some. Uh, I answer. I asked that question. I'm uh, Mike. Um, yeah. It's not. It doesn't seem to be formally documented. Yes, that is true. so. Uh, that's all why it's not often seen or used. Answer, I will. I will answer these uh, questions formally. Um, um, in, in the Google document uh, after uh, it give me a few days or maybe a week and everybody will get an answer. Um, and I will try to get you uh, this information as well, how to do that. Because I know that there was somebody, it was not by much and it was somebody using Pyron, um, which is similar in a way um, that came with the same, uh, had the same point. So it is possible to, to update the structure. I think the only thing that you cannot do, I mean, you can change the positions, but I don't think that you should, uh, you, you can't add atoms. Things like that is not possible. That's reasonable. Yeah, because that, that is uh, changing the number of electrons might, might mean that, that whole data structures would have to change. Uh, that is more difficult to do on the fly. But interactive structure updates, I'm pretty sure it exists. And I can, can I, I will try to get you a description of how to do that. Uh, it, it is informally documented in ASE, um, but it doesn't seem to uh, get I a lot of support because it's not formally documented. Yeah, yeah. And I think there was a, some problem with it because somebody uh, of your uh, Neugebauer's group that that doesn't use Pymogen but Pyron, so they have their own uh, Python environment. They wanted to do something like that and they had some trouble and I think we've solved it. So, so it should be possible to do that. Thank you. Okay. Um, bop, 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 bop. In cases where memory becomes a significant problem, is it best to go back to the older, slower ACFET algorithm? Um, I would say that uh, that it's not a, that in essence it's not a very good idea to go back to the older um, ACFET algorithm because in the cases where you are um, running into serious memory trouble, I guess that the n to the power four of the old algorithm is already killing you. Um, so you can try to reduce the size of the frequency grid. Yes, um, the code so setting n omega pi and n tau pi to one will also help and in essence the only thing that uh, if that is not enough then the only thing that will help is uh, to run on more nodes uh, because the memory uh, usage is uh, significant but it's distributed so i mean at some point we are now going to go uh, to exascale computing I hope that means that we can uh, can get more and more nodes for our problems, and uh, that would help in this in this sense as well. So, how does the RPA for work for three D transition metals? Since implementation is perturbative, is there a self consistent version of this uh, RPA correlation? Um, well, I, I, I didn't show the slides um, because I was already uh, pressed for time, but we have done uh, 3D and 4D uh, metals uh, in the RPA, basically studied uh, lattice constant and things like that, and they come out uh, very nicely. 
So that works quite well. A self-consistent version of this RPA correlation. So the, the, uh, when you are asking for um, GW, then yes, there is a way to do uh, this self-consistently. Um, so there's all kinds of flavors where, where you, uh, what you, what you self-consistently update and what not. And there are all kinds of guidelines of what makes sense to, to update and what actually deteriorates the result. Um, yeah, so yes, there is a possibility to do that. I when will it, yeah, sorry. So I, I, I was the, uh, I asked the question, my name is Das. Um, yeah. So I my asked. question is um, specifically related to the fact that sometimes the, the cone sham orbitals might be wrong because, you know, you predict the wrong, um, like you predict yeah. the metal have an insulator and so on. And that's when you run into trouble with the perturbative corrections. So, um, yes. the, yeah. So if that if the orbitals, for instance, uh, it's a good point. So if the orbitals are strongly wrong, like in three D transition metals, it might be a good uh, uh, a good idea to start actually from not from DFT orbitals but from uh, HSE orbitals. So you can start your you can do your for instance your GW calculation on top of uh, of a hybrid functional. That's important. So you yeah. just start, you, instead of the PB, you just start with an HSC run and then yes. you run of the algorithm. Okay. Yes, that, that, that can already help. The, the thing with self-consistency here though is that, I mean, you can already do a lot. Uh, um, you can, of course, you can rely on self-consistency uh, to uh, help you here, um, but you have to be careful where you put in the self-consistency. Mm -hmm. So if you, put in the self-consistency um, in the screening properties, that is almost always a bad idea with, um, with the RPA. Mm -hmm. I see. So, you, yeah. so updating in GW, updating uh, quasi-particle energies and or orbitals uh, in uh, the Green's function uh, often helps, but right. updating the screening properties uh, mostly is a bad idea. Right, so you, you recommend the, the so-called GW0 type uh, version. Uh, yes. Correct. Okay. Yeah, and that is because, uh, that is because the, um, there's an error cancellation, huh? because we are, of course, the screening properties get computed in the random phase approximation, which is an approximation, and the random phase approximation makes a certain error, and that uh, often cancels against the fact that you use uh, uh, eigen energies from DFT. So mm -hmm. these eigenenergy differences are too small and that cancels against uh, the error that you make uh, using the random phase approximation. So right. it's often a bad idea to use screening from any other uh, source than, um, than DFT, unless the DFT um, uh, eigenvalue spectrum is badly wrong. For instance, if DFT predicts something to be a metal, whereas it should be an insulator, then it's probably a very good idea to do your RPA on top of a hybrid functional. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and the exchange part um, itself is that a Hartree Fock exchange, or are you, or or is it some sort of OEP type exchange that is included in this? Uh, it is. It is. Uh, it's Hartree Fock exchange, but using the um, the DFT orbitals. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's the Hartree Fock at DFT. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay, can the ACFTT formalism be used to calculate optical excitation lifetimes? If yes, is there any plan to add this functionality past in the future? Yes, it can, and yes, there is. Um, so, yes, one can use it um, to do this, to calculate uh, excitation lifetimes, and yes, we plan to do that. Can I say a few words about forces in the RPA? Yes, I can say uh, a few words about it. Maybe. I will quickly throw in uh, a little slide just to, to uh, because I, well, I do have it. So basically the trick uh, with RPA forces is the fact that um, it, uh, mostly you are not uh, in, a, in, a, in a situation of self-consistency. So the orbitals that you use are from DFT and they are not, uh, if you so want, uh, eigenstates of the, of the um, Hamiltonian. So they're not, these DFT orbitals 
are not eigenstates of the quasi-particle equation, if you so want. And that means that we get additional terms in the forces uh, related. Uh, and if, you are, if your orbitals are eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, then the hellman feynman theorem tells you that the forces are essentially this here. And if they are not, then you get non hellman feynman contributions to the forces. And they are not so easy to compute, so it's quite involved uh, to compute them. But that has been done. Uh, and essentially, um, well, here you can see that it works. So the RPA forces computed in the formalism that I, that I quickly showed on the previous slide are the lines. And you can, of course, uh, get the forces as energy derivatives from finite differences. Those are the symbols. And they match over uh, quite a large uh, range of displacements. Um, yeah. So those uh, are. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah. Sorry for interruption. So this is 10:30 already. So Martin, feel free to you know stop. I think you are missing your dinner time. I guess. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to drink a beer now, actually. Um, <laughs> okay. So if you want to, yeah, definitely, yeah, you can continue, but uh, you can stop right now. I will, like I said, I will, uh, I will make sure that all these questions are answered. Okay. Uh, cool. In the Google Doc. So will you leave this Google Doc simply there? Is that okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So um, I, I, I think let's stop here, right? So um, I think the rest of the questions can be answered later um, in offline. I will try to get everybody uh, a, a satisfactory question and we can maybe discuss a bit through this Google Doc until everybody is sort of satisfied with the answer that they've gotten. Is that okay? Yeah, sounds great. So everybody has access to this, uh, I mean, right access to this Google Doc. So okay. if you want to, I. I think you can continue discuss um, in this uh, Google Doc. So okay. um, yeah, thank you so much and give our users like wonderful. Very welcome. Talk. Yeah, I, I really appreciate. So let's do this little game. Uh, actually, if everybody look at the Zoom session, yeah. there is a reaction button. So if you enjoy the, uh, I mean, Martin's talk, give thumb up or like clap. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank okay. you so much. Okay, bye-bye, guys. Hey. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.